I'm on call. It's my first night on call. And I have this patient uh, in the ICU. It's about midnight. And we rounded during the day, but then somehow he showed up. And I had no idea who this person was. He was on a ventilator. He had his crazy surgery where they took part of his middle ear and removed it and put a piece of muscle and skin from his abdomen and put it on the side of his face. And it was a very grotesque looking wound. And he, he was on a ventilator. And all I knew was that the uh, pulmonologist wanted him in here to try to work on his breathing. But no one ever told me anything about him. And he was very, very agitated. So what happened was during the night, he pulled out his IV. So the nurse says, hey, you know, the doctor's there. Put, replace the IV. She said, can you put back the IV? I said, sure, no problem. Put him in the IV. He's in restraint. Put the IV back in. About an hour later, he takes his endotracheal tube out. And all of a sudden, they put him on a face mask, and he's breathing, and they're suctioning him, and he's doing okay. So I'm like, all right, I didn't mean to do this, but he didn't mean for it to happen, but he looks like he's doing good. So the pulmonologist who comes in in the morning is probably gonna be very happy because he's off the ventilator, you know? I didn't wean him, but he's off and he's okay. So then a few more times he gets agitated. I think he might've pulled out his IV again one more time. I put it back in. Finally around 5.15 in the morning, I have a chance to get some sleep. And I only have 45 minutes to sleep because at 6 a.m. I have to be up to draw the blood on all 15 of the patients in the ICU. It was the doctor's job in the morning from 6 to 7. He drew all the blood on all 15 patients. So I was like, I have 45 minutes to sleep. But there was no place, there was no place to sleep. You, I didn't have a room. The only thing I had was a little bit of a space where I could put chairs. And I took a picture of this yesterday because that was the exact, the exact same chair that I had to sleep on. And I had four of them. So what I did was I put four of those together. Now, I think a bed of nails would have been more comfortable than putting four of those type of chairs together because there's no bottom, you know? So the sleeping on four of them together and about 10 minutes later at 525, the nurse shakes me. And he's like, he pulled out his Foley catheter and he's bleeding from the penis. She's like, but don't worry, I, I stopped it. I stopped it, but we have to give him something. He's going, we have to give him something uh, to sedate him. Okay, so now I'm drawing back on all my vast medical knowledge, which was this one month at Bellevue with all the patients who <laughs> were in alcohol withdrawal, the young, healthy patients who were all shaking. And every time I gave them any medication, you don't have alprazolam here, you have midazolam, but alprazolam is very similar. And we would just give them the medication, they would relax. And then maybe two hours later, they were back and they were shaking. And so I always thought that the dose, the common dose was two milligrams for everyone. So she wakes me up. I'm on these chairs, I say two milligrams, let's give him two milligrams of lorazepam, and then I go back to sleep on my chair. About 20 minutes later, she shakes me really vigorously, and she says, he's not breathing, he's not breathing. And I quickly sprung up, you know, although I had been on my feet for 24 hours, I was so tired, but my hair was like this, I looked terrible, and I look, and I go to his bed, and I froze, I was, so afraid because I had never seen a person look that purple in my life. <laughs> and I did, but she, and the nurse, luckily for her, because I was a young intern, I didn't know what I was doing. She's like, we should, we should, we should start bagging him, right? We should start ventilating him. I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. And I look and I see he's still got vital signs. So I'm like, okay, he's got vital signs, all right. So um, she bags him. The anesthesiologist came quickly, too, and they put back in the tube. And his color started turning from purple to a color that was much more compatible with life. And I was like, and then he woke, and then he started pulling for the tube again, and I'm like, yes, he's back, he's back. Thank God, thank you, thank you. 
because I thought I really had killed this man. So I said, okay, let me go to his chart. Let me read about him because I should have gotten up off my chairs and I should have read about him first to see what's the story with him. But I didn't because I said, oh, he needs sedation. What is the chart going to tell me that I don't already know? He's ag agitated and he needs sedation. So I'm like, okay, I'll read it anyway. So it's, it's like, it's 10 to 6 in the morning. I got 10 minutes left before the, my start of my day, but I'm already like shaking. And I read the chart. And I read the chart and it says, uh, there was a consult from the psychiatrist. And it said, ask to see this patient for, for agitation who received a dose of lorazepam and went into respiratory arrest from getting the, the, the medication that I had just given. And it said in big capital letters, do not, I repeat, do not give him lorazepam. If you do, give him one-tenth the dose, a tiny, tiny amount, but give maybe haloperidol because it's safer because he has obstructive lung disease and he's very, very sensitive to the, uh, to the drug. And I said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I did exactly what they told me not to do. Now the attending, when he came in the morning, the head doctor, he walks in, he's like, and he sees his patient, and I'm looking from the side, you know, just, I don't even want to talk to him, but he sees his patient on the ventilator just when he left. So he doesn't think there was anything different. He left, the patient was on the ventilator, he came back, the patient's on the ventilator. But then he started reading the chart and he read my note, and I could see his face changing, that some intern gave him the same thing that caused him to go into respiratory failure. So I went over to him, and without waiting, I apologized and told him that, really, <laughs> I made a mistake, and I'm sorry, and I've learned more than anything could ever teach, teach me about giving medications to patients and knowing as much about every patient that you need to know. And he, I think, probably felt sorry for me because I looked so horrible <laughs> and so worried that he did not you know, give me an argument or, or, or yell at me anymore. He thought that I was already tough enough on myself. But the point being, when we talk about this in M&M conference, or when I would have to talk about it, you know, the person who committed the mistake would have to just go up in front of the, the audience and talk about it. And it was kind of embarrassing for the person, but the whole emphasis on the M&M conference when 20 years ago was, blame the person who made the mistake, kind of shame them, and then retrain them. It, because if you made a mistake, it was because you didn't work hard enough, or you're not smart enough, or something like that. They never looked at the other factors. Now, of course, I blamed myself, and I was tough on myself, but no one ever said, hey, where was the handoff for this patient? This intern didn't know anything about this person, and he shows up in the ICU. How can a critically ill patient be taken care of and nobody tell the doctor why he's here or what's going on. How could a doctor give somebody a medication, the exact same medication that caused them to go into respiratory failure? How can we have a system with no safety net that would allow a doctor to do exactly the same thing that happened without the pharmacy or some sort of alert coming up in the system? How could that happen? And that's the thing that medicine started to realize um, right around the year 2000. And I was always saying this, when I finished training, I started giving talks on medical errors. I said, you know what, medical errors is an important topic because to me, I didn't learn, I mean, I learned as much by just going to these conferences and paying attention and saying, wow, I don't wanna make the mistake I just heard or I don't wanna, I need to learn from that. It's, it could be a very, very important teaching tool. And I would speak about this, and then all of a sudden the Institute of Medicine came out with their report in 1999 to Air is Human. And I said, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've been talking about 